right, as we turn to the word preached, let's ask for God's blessing upon it. Father God, we do praise you and thank you that by your death and resurrection that uh, we now have uh, atonement for our sins, that we have victory over death and the devil and sin itself. We thank you for all that you've accomplished and all that you grant to us now freely by grace and through faith. We ask that as we now look particularly at your word from the book of Revelation that you would continue to instruct us, uh, convict us, encourage us, and as always we ask that you would minister personally to our hearts uh, and that you would do precisely what we need. Lord, you know, we know that you know exactly what we need at this very moment and so we trust that you will in fact uh, provide by your grace uh, the, the, uh, the equipping uh, of us so that we would leave here all the more uh, blessed and all the more uh, ready to then obey you in faith and everything we do. So God, we pray for this blessing now to apply to every single one of us. We ask it in the good name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so as it says up here on the slide, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18 today. And so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them up to this New Testament book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 11 through 18 is our passage, and it's going to conclude chapter 11, or chapter 13 for today, and it will uh, then continue where we left off actually from two weeks ago. So if you recall the last time we were here, at the start of chapter 13, verses 1 through 10, we saw how John, at this point in the Revelation, he saw a beast, it says, arise out of the sea. And uh, this beast was described as having seven heads and ten horns and many diadems on its uh, horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And it had, um, it says that it uh, was described like a leopard and a lion and a bear in various ways. And it tells us uh, from this description, we saw that it was uh, given its power also from the dragon. And so, from all of this, we, uh, we won't go into all of it now, today, at this point, but we argued from all of this that this beast that arose from the sea uh, actually represented the empire of Rome itself. All right. <laughs> Time back in. All right, so uh, we argued that the, empire, that the first beast uh, uh, represented the empire of Rome, and, uh, and then from this, we saw that the beast, therefore Rome, made war on the saints for 42 months, we were told in the text. That was verse 5 and verse 7. And we saw that this is, in fact, precisely what happened in the first century in the A.D. 60s, from November of A.D. 64 through June of A.D. 68, which is 42 months and some odd days. The Empire of Rome actually led, under the Emperor Nero, uh, an official persecution against the church. And then we saw, after this, that one of the heads of the beast, it said, received a mortal wound that appeared to therefore kill the beast, but then it actually was healed and it revived. That was in verse 3 and 4 of last week. And we then argue that this symbolized how Nero, the emperor of Rome at the time, uh, who is described as one of the heads, as we see in Revelation 17.10, he committed suicide in A.D. 68. And so he, being one of the heads, received a mortal wound, and after this, the entire empire was plunged into chaos and anarchy, such that it almost seemed to not survive. Uh, but then, uh, we see that a man named Vespasian becomes the new emperor eventually, and he brings stability back to the empire. And so the empire itself receives a mortal wound, seems to die, but then it actually revives and lives after all, just as we saw described in our text last week. And while all of this was going on, we saw that Israel, the apostate nation of Israel at this point, sided with Rome against the Christians in this persecution. That was verse 8. And so John, therefore, exhorts the readers to endure in the faith and to not give up. That was verse 10. So in light of all of this persecution that was going on at this time, he, he basically encourages them to, to keep, keep the faith, endure, do not give up, keep pressing forward. Okay? And that's where things came to a close, and so that's where we then pick things up directly in our text for this morning. And so if you'd please rise as we read our passage for this morning. Again, it's uh, Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. Starting in verse 11, this is the word of the Lord. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, 
and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Thus ends the reading of God's word. May he write it on our hearts by faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. All right, so that is the passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at now for this morning. And uh, uh, as we just got done reading here, we see, really, this, this little section in Revelation is now uh, devoted to this description of another beast. Uh, my ESV heading over this section is even entitled, The Second Beast. And so John now sees another beast arise on the scene, and we see some of the various things that it, do, it does and some of the various ways that it is described. And so, very similar then to what we uh, examined two weeks ago when we looked at the first beast, uh, this now second beast also has a, uh, a plethora of different interpretations or understandings as to what exactly it symbolizes or what it is representing. So, for instance, uh, it is a very common uh, interpretation of this by many people today that this second beast uh, represents some sort of religious figure that usually associated with the end time. So many will argue that this is going to be a religious figure that arises at some point in the future, usually during the Great Tribulation, that again is understood to be a seven year period at the end of time. So many think it's a religious figure that arises during that point, who is then going to kind of convince everybody in the world to go and worship the first beast, or to worship who, again, they often associate the first beast and the Antichrist to be the same person. So they, will, they argue that it's going to be some sort of religious figure who arises at the end of time to persuade everybody to worship the Antichrist or the beast. Right? That's a very common thing you'll hear today as it pertains to the second beast. Other people will often argue that uh, this second beast, uh, again, is not necessarily any particular person or entity, uh, but rather it is just a generic reference to how there will be false religions and false teachers on down through the ages, uh, which is true enough. There will be false teachers and false religions down through the ages, but many will therefore argue that that's, that's what this is in fact describing. And again, contrary to either of those two understandings, uh, I am going to instead take the argument that this uh, second beast is actually a description now of the apostate religious leaders in Israel in the first century. Okay? So I'm going to argue that the uh, second beast that is being described in this text is a reference to the apostate religious leaders in Israel in the first century. And so whereas the first beast represents the empire of Rome in general, here now we've got the apostate leaders in Israel and the things that they're doing in connection with the uh, empire of Rome. So we kind of see how these two beasts play off each other at this point in history. Okay? And so there it is, just like two weeks ago, I'm laying my cards on the table to reveal where I stand as it pertains to what this second beast is and what he does. And so now at this point, like usual, we will simply work through the text verse by verse to see specifically what it's exactly saying and to further that argument. And then we will make some applications for our life today. So if you'll turn your attention back to verse 11 and 12, it began by saying, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Okay, so once again, as we've just been emphasizing many times now, John at this point in the Revelation sees another beast. And he sees it arising out of the earth this time. 
Alright, whereas the first beast that he saw, do you remember back in verse 1, arose out of the sea. And we saw that that was telling because, as we mentioned many times, the sea uh, in the book of Revelation, and as we see many times in the Old Testament prophetic books, is often a symbol or a representation of the Gentile land itself. And so for the first beast to arise out of the sea uh, already gives us a clue that it was going to arise out of the Gentile lands. And so we argue that it's Rome, and sure enough, Rome arises out of the Gentile lands. But now, in contrast to that, the second beast, it says, is coming out of the earth. And the earth, uh, the, the, the word, as we've also mentioned many times, is literally the, the Greek word ge, G-E, which means land, right? And whereas sea is very often a symbol for the Gentile nations, references to the land is almost always a reference to the land of Israel which therefore indicates to us that this second beast is arising out of the land of Israel at this time. Right? And so, sure enough, again, kind of going back to what we're arguing, we're arguing that it is the apostate religious leaders, and so it makes sense for them to arise out of the land of Israel. And as we will also go on to see later uh, in the months to come, when we get to Revelation 16, 13, 19, 20, and 20, verse 10, we will actually see continued references to not only the first beast, but also the second beast as well. And, but he, the second beast, is oftentimes synonymously associated with what's called the false prophet. All right? And therefore, indicating that this second beast does have a religious uh, entity, or it's kind of religious at its core, which again would make sense if it is the apostate uh, religious leaders in Jerusalem at this time. Okay? So it's the second beast is coming out of Israel. I'm arguing it's the religious leaders uh, in Israel. Now, with that said, we're given its description as well. We're told that it had two horns like a lamb, which is to say that its appearance uh, does not seem as intimidating as the first beast. Because if you remember the first beast, it said it had seven heads and ten horns and many diadems, and it had the appearance of a lion and a bear and a leopard. Right, which again are all ferocious predator animals. If you happen to be walking in the woods one night and you come across a lion or a leopard or a bear, you would be intimidated. This would be a little frightening. But if you run across a lamb or a, a lamb, yeah, it's just it's not as intimidating. You wouldn't you wouldn't be as freaked out. And the fact that it only has two horns, in contrast to the uh, the first beast's ten horns, uh, horns themselves were often symbols in the ancient world for just raw brute strength. Which is to say, therefore, that this second beast is not actually as powerful as far as that brute strength goes. Uh, and so it looks like a lamb, but despite its seemingly non-intimidating appearance, it nevertheless speaks like a dragon. Which, therefore, again, is to indicate that even though it doesn't look that intimidating, it actually is quite sinister in nature. And the very fact that it's speaking like a dragon, this association with the dragon, we saw in chapter 12 that the dragon itself is the devil, which therefore indicates that the, the, this second beast is also demonic in its origin. It's, it's, it's being the mouthpiece of Satan, as it were. Just as the first beast was given its authority from the dragon, so now the second beast is speaking, essentially, on behalf of the dragon. They're both devilish in its origin. Right? And so, you put all this together, this description of a seemingly docile, non-threatening on the outside beast, and yet quite sinister on the inside, is very similar to how we see Jesus describe the religious leaders of Israel, even during his ministry. For instance, in Matthew 7, 15, we're told that uh, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Or... In John 8.44, Jesus one at one point condemns the Jewish religious authorities in his day by saying that you, the re religious authorities, are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. So again, Jesus, in speaking of the religious leaders of his day, says that they are of the devil, they're demonic ultimately. However, interestingly, they'll often come to you in sheep's clothing. They'll often look quite fine, they'll look pretty good. But inside they are, in fact, ravenous wolves. They're beastly on the inside. And sure enough, going back to our text, this is now exactly what this second beast is like. It looks like a lamb. It looks seemingly non-threatening. But it is actually demonic and devilish and dragonish on the inside. And notice here in verse 12 that it says that it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. 
And so now we see this is an indication that this second beast and the first beast are in league with one another. They're cooperating with one another to accomplish their purposes. So therefore, again, with the first beast being Rome, the second beast being the Jewish religious authorities, this is to say that Rome and the Jewish religious authorities are cooperating with one another. They are teaming up in various things to get things done. And that very phrase of it exercising its authority in its presence, and that phrase, interestingly, is very frequently used, especially in the Old Testament, uh, often to refer the prophets' relation to the Lord. Uh, it would often speak of the prophets being in the presence of the Lord uh, at various times. We see this in 1 Samuel 1.22, uh, 2.18, 1 Kings 17.1, Hosea 6.2, Jonah 1.3, Jonah 1.10, and so on and so forth. Uh, usually it's in a good reference to how the uh, prophets would stand in the presence of the Lord and then do the Lord's bidding or speak on behalf of the Lord, say the Lord's words to the people, right? That's usually the context that it's often used in, but now we see that it's the second beast who is standing in the presence of the first beast doing its bidding, essentially. So, like, that is to say, the second beast is kind of acting as the deputy of the first beast, and, uh, and in this, as acting as its deputy, it tells us then that it makes the whole earth, which again is to say the land, and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Right? So there is this sense in which the Jewish religious authorities are even ascribing worship to the first beast, Rome. Which, as we've said many times, if you were to have actually asked a Jew in the first century, do you worship the Roman Empire, they would have most certainly said, of course not, we don't worship the Roman Empire. And yet this is exactly what John says they are doing because of their cooperation with Rome to then persecute the church. Their cooperation with Rome was viewed as a, as ultimately as a worship unto Rome or unto the beast. And in that, even as far as that goes, we see now kind of almost like a, a devilish parody of this going on because Christians, the church, worships Jesus who was crucified and resurrected. And now we see that the Jewish religious authorities, the second beast, is ultimately worshipping the first beast, Rome, which we saw uh, had, you know, mortal wound to its head, but was then healed. And so just as they, you know, just as Christ was crucified and risen, so now the Roman Empire, in a sense, was destroyed and then came back to life. And just as Christians worship the Lord Jesus, so now the apostate religious leaders are worshipping Rome, kind of like their, you know, false Jesus or false messiah or false prophet, as it were. Right? That leads us to verse 13 and 14. It, the second beast, performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Okay, so now we see at this point that the second beast, Jewish religious authorities, performs great signs. And, once again, this is exactly what Jesus said would be the case of false prophets who were to come in his generation, as we see in Matthew 24, 24. Jesus is specifically addressing that generation as these will be things that happen in the first century. He says that false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Right? False Christ, false prophets, performing great signs so as to lead astray people. This is what Jesus said is going to happen in that first century generation. And these signs that they're going to perform are going to be so convincing that if it were possible, Jesus says, even the elect would be deceived. The very way he words that seems to imply that such a thing is not actually possible, that if you're truly elect, then you will not be deceived by these things. Uh, but his point is to emphasize the, the deceptive nature of these signs. These people who arise, he says, are not going to just be doing mere sleight of hand tricks, like, wow, that's pretty impressive, but I can see how you're doing that. It's, it's actually, they're, they're likely doing this with the help of demons. They're actually performing supernatural signs. And again, we see this very thing actually happen throughout the book of Acts on various instances where there would be Jewish sorcerers who are actually doing magical things. We see this in Acts 8, 9, 13, 6, 19, 13, where there would be Jewish false prophets doing actual uh, supernatural things to deceive people. So Jesus said this was going to happen, and again, sure enough, we see now this very thing happening 
in our text. It, Jesus said that it would deceive many, and that's what now here in Revelation 13 these false teachers are doing. They're performing great signs and deceiving those who dwell on the earth, which again is to say those who dwell in the land, uh, the land of Israel. Many people are going to be flocking to uh, these, these false teachers. Okay? And notice what they're doing as they're, as they're teaching these things. It says they're going to tell them to make an image for the beast. Now keep that phrase in mind because we're going to see it now again reappear in verse 15 many times. It says in verse 15, And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would, would, would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Okay? So again, it keeps emphasizing that this, this uh, second beast is going to create this image, and it's going to require everybody to essentially worship this image or else. Okay? And so we can now ask the question, uh, so what exactly is this reference to the image of the beast? Because it occurs now four times in two verses. And what I would argue that the image of the beast is actually referring to here is not like an actual like physical idol per se that they were making in the first century, but rather I would simply argue that this is actually a reference to apostate Judaism itself. That the false image that they are creating is apostate Judaism. And the reason I would argue that is because, to kind of just use a diagram to help show this, properly speaking, we've got God the Father, right? And from God the Father is, or, you know, like God the Father sends God the Son, who we are told in Scripture is the image of the Father. That's Colossians 1.15, that uh, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that he's the exact imprint of his nature, Okay, so you've got the Father, and, and then you've got the Son, who is in the image of the Father, and then you've got the church, right? And just by, sometimes yeah, I was maybe anticipating you might have expected to see the Holy Spirit, um, but this is not a diagram for the Trinity, so I'm not saying that the church is the third person of the Trinity. This is not what this diagram is trying to show, but rather from the Son, Jesus says that he was going to build the church, and we're told in Scripture that the church is actually in the image of the Son. Uh, so we see that in Romans 8, 29, where to, uh, we're said, it says that those whom he, the Father, foreknew, the elect, the church, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son. Okay, so the church is to be conformed into the image of Jesus, and Jesus is in the image of the Father. Okay, so we kind of see that idea of, you know, that kind of sequential nature of things. Now, again, in a sort of uh, unholy parody of all of this, we see how Satan tries to take it and then corrupt it or to twist it. Such that, in Revelation, we now see that at the top, the devil puts himself, the dragon itself. And then from the devil, right, he gives his authority, it says, to the first beast, whom we argued was Rome. And the very description of the first beast, as having seven heads, ten horns, many diadems, is essentially exactly the same as the dragon. Which is to say, the first beast is made in the image of the, dra of the dragon. And again, as we've already alluded to, just as Jesus was crucified and rose again, so the first beast seemed to be mortally struck and then rose again. So Satan is kind of creating this unholy parody of what the Lord has actually done. And then from the first beast comes the second beast, and we've argued that the second beast is the Jewish religious authorities, and they are in the image of the first beast, just as the church is in the image of the first uh, of, the, of Jesus. And just as the church goes forth and declares the, the good message of Christ and points everybody to Jesus, so now this second beast, it says, is pointing everybody to the first beast. Okay? So you put all that together, and so when it says that the second beast is making an image of the first beast, what is the image of the first beast? They, the second beast, is the image of the first beast. So when it says that they're making an image of the beast, it is to say that they are making an image of themselves, or in other words, what this is actually indicating is that the Jewish authorities in the first century sought to enforce everybody, including the Christians, to conform to their own image. They were seeking everybody to conform to apostate Judaism. They were seeking everybody to conform back to the synagogues, which had now at this point become the synagogues of Satan, as we learned earlier in Revelation. They're trying to convince everybody to come back to temple worship and to resume the temple sacrifices which had been done away with by Christ. They're trying to persuade everybody to come back to Judaism. And if you did not, as we go back to our text, you could be slain, or you could be severely punished. And again, we see this very thing play out, uh, as we were just discussing this morning, even in Sunday school. In the, uh, for instance, in AD 762, 
in Jerusalem, James, who was Jesus' half-brother, and he became the, uh, he was the author of the book of James. He was the leader in the church in Jerusalem at this time, right? He was living at that time in AD 62, and the Jewish authorities essentially demanded that he denounce the name of Christ, that he deny Christ or else. And he wouldn't do it, right? They put him up onto the pinnacle of the temple and they said, deny it, and he wouldn't. And instead he started preaching the gospel and people were getting saved. And so they said, we made a big mistake. So they run up there, they grab James, they throw him off the pinnacle of the temple. He lands, he doesn't die, he's still breathing. And so they stone him with stones afterwards. He's still breathing and so someone comes with a club and smashes his head until he dies, okay? And so all that to say though, the Jewish you know, religious leaders were persecuting the Christians, demanding you conform to our image. You conform to apostate Judaism, or else, or else be slain. And so, that's what we see now happening here in the text. The second beast is demanding everybody come back to them. And not only that, but then as we go into verse 16 and 17, it says, Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. So that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast, or the number of its name. Alright, so now here we are getting to yet another passage within Revelation uh, that's, again, even kind of nominal people, or people of nominal understanding of this book, uh, at least are somewhat familiar with. And that is this whole passage about the mark of the beast. And uh, we're going to see in verse 18 more details as to what exactly this mark of the beast is. But notice first off that uh, it, uh, it's an economic tool. It says no one is going to be able to buy or sell unless they receive this mark. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter if you're small or great, rich or poor, free or slave. You need this mark if you're going to buy and sell. Okay? Now, with all that said, uh, this is usually the point where many fanciful ideas or theories come into play as to what exactly this mark is that if someone's going to have to receive if they're going to be able to buy or sell. And so some of the uh, theories out there is that this represents some sort of tattoo that you will literally have to get on your hand or forehead. Uh, some people have argued that this represents uh, credit cards with the numbers that they have and you won't be able to buy or sell without these things. Some have argued that it refers to social security numbers. Some people have argued that it refers to computer or microchips that will be implanted into your skin. Some people think that it's an actual barcode that you'll have to have branded on you or tattooed on you, on your hand, and you'll have to scan that if you're going to be able to buy things in the future. Uh, some people, uh, I've seen YouTube videos of um, some lady trying to argue that the monster, or the energy drink monster, is uh, what the actual mark of the beast is because of the various symbols on the can and whatnot. Uh, in more recent times, uh, it's been argued that it was the jab that was going to be the mark of the beast because if you don't get it, you'll be fired, you won't be able to buy and sell. And all of these things, and then literally, there's a whole plethora of interpretations as to what is this mark that people are going to have to get. And uh, again, contrary to all of those understandings, I would argue that none of those things are actually what this is talking about at all, but rather to help us actually understand what this mark of the beast is talking about. First off, notice that it does say that it's going to be on the right hand or the forehead. Okay? Now again, many people therefore just think, well, literally, like, okay, so whatever this mark is, I'm going to have to get it on my hand or forehead. But again, I'm not actually, I'm arguing that it's not a literal mark that you're going to have to get on those places, but rather, like usual, what we have to do is we have to go to the rest of Scripture to see if this kind of language appears anywhere else to then give us insight into what John is actually talking about when he uses this kind of language. And sure enough, there's actually a handful of places that uh, make references to this kind of thing. But one of the primary ones is over in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, which I don't have on the slide. You can listen to it, otherwise you can flip to it if you want to. But in Deuteronomy 6, chapter, uh, verses 4 through 9, this is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. All right, so there, in this Deuteronomy passage, we are told that uh, the people, the people of God, are to love the Lord with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength 
and they are to have the law of God in their hearts, such that they're teaching it to their children, they're teaching it as they go, they're teaching it as they lie down, when they rise up on the doorpost of their house. The, the, the law of God is to govern everything about them, and it explicitly says to write it on their hand and to be as frontless between their eyes, or in other words, on their forehead. So he's saying have the law of God on your hand and in your head, on your head. And again, he doesn't mean that literally, as if you literally had to write out the law on your hand or literally post it to your forehead. It, it was symbolic to indicate that everything, the person of God, like the, the man of God, the woman of God, their whole being is to therefore be governed by the law of God. Everything they do, which symbolizes their hands, and everything they think is to be governed by the law of God and out of love for God. That's what it means to have it on your hand or on your forehead. It means everything about you is loyal to, you know, the one to whom you're serving. And so in this case, you're loyal to the Lord and to his law. That's what it means to have it on your hand and on your forehead. Therefore, for now the beast to imply that you've got to have it on your hand or your forehead. It doesn't mean a literal mark that you're going to have to receive uh, on those places, but rather it simply indicates that you're going to have to be entirely loyal to the beast. And again, the first piece that you have to get this mark of is Rome. And so what this is saying is that if you're going to be able to buy and sell, and you're going to be able to just get along at peace seemingly in the first century, you need to be absolutely loyal to the Roman Empire. Right? That's what the mark is talking about. It's not a literal mark that, that, you know, that we often, as the, all the things I was just mentioning. And we know that it's, you have to be completely loyal to Rome because John is actually now going to straightforwardly tell us even more that this is the case in the last verse, in verse 18. He says this, This calls for wisdom, but the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Okay, so now again, John is now actually going to straight, he's actually, he's, he's telling the, his readers who he's talking about. He's telling them what he's talking about. However, he's not going to do it absolutely straightforwardly. He can't actually say, this is what it is, because if you also do remember, John is on the island of Patmos as an exile under Roman you know, authority. He's basically in prison here, and so everything he sends out is going to be reviewed by Roman officials before it can even get out. And so he can't just write out, say, the beast is the Roman Empire, and Nero's a really bad guy, and stuff like that. He can't be that straightforward, because they're going to read this, and it'll be, you know, seditious writing, and they won't let it go. And so he's got to be a little more subtle. He's got to be more actually sneaky, in a sense. And that's why he actually prefaces what he's about to say with this. He says, okay, this calls for wisdom. You're going to need a little understanding on this. It's going to, you're going to put, have to put your, your thinking cap on here, okay? And he then says, okay, I'm going to give you a calculation, right? You've got to calculate something that I'm about to give you. And what I'm about to give you is actually a number of a man. So John says, I'm thinking of a specific person, all right? So there again, just right off the bat, for those then who kind of continue to argue that it's, it's going to be one of those things, a social security number, a credit card, a, you know, all those things that I mentioned. Again, it kind of it, it negates the fact that John explicitly says, no, 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 I'm talking about a man. What I'm thinking of is a specific person, but I can't say his name just outright. And so I'm going to give you a little riddle. I'm going to give you a clue, right? So calculate this number that I'm about to give you, okay? And the number, again, was 666. Okay, so take that number, he says, calculate it, and that will that'll help you know who I'm talking about. Okay? Now, therefore, how should we, how should we uh, you know, compute this riddle? Two things. Number one, it's important to know that the number six itself in Scripture is actually very often associated as the number of mankind. So numbers often symbolize various things in Scripture. So seven is often the number of completeness or perfection. Number ten is usually the idea of multitudes or many. Four is often the number of the land or the earth. And so the number six is often associated with mankind. Mankind was made on the sixth day. Mankind was given six days to work. There were six cities of refuge if you accidentally killed a man. And on and on it goes. Number six often represented mankind. And then, interestingly, as we see in Scripture, if you take the number six and then you multiply it, or you just kind of give multiple sixes, this was often a symbol of evil mankind trying to oppose God. So, for instance, in 1 Samuel 17, we see the man, Goliath, who is a very large man, uh, he is described as being six cubits and a span tall, and his spear was 600 shekels. 
So it gives us this evil man opposing God, and we get all these six numerals to describe him. Uh, in uh, Daniel 3, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, made a statue of himself that was 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. Again, a tyrant man with these six numerals to describe his activities. Uh, in 1 Kings 10, 14 and 2 Chronicles 9, 13, we're told that King Solomon, who had otherwise started very good, and the Lord had blessed him mightily. Nevertheless, uh, 1 Kings 10, 14 tells us that in one year he received 666 talents of gold. So the exact same number of gold that he received. And it's fascinating that literally right after this description in 1 Kings 10, it goes on to explain how Solomon then basically broke all of the laws of the king, as, it, as is recorded in Deuteronomy 17. He multiplied gold, which kings weren't supposed to do, actually. He multiplied horses, which kings were not supposed to do. And he multiplied wives, which kings were not supposed to do. The rest of chapter 10 describes how he did that. And then chapter 11 opens up with how he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And all of his wives turned his heart away from the Lord. So that he actually abandoned the Lord. He started making high places for all of the false gods and the abominable practices that accompanied them. So, so therefore, the number 666 specifically then often not only represented tyrannical men trying to oppose God, but it also was kind of like this sinister, foreboding idea of a man committing apostasy against God. And then not only that, but we continue to see this very pattern in John chapter 19, where it's fascinatingly told that Jesus, during his trial, arrested on the sixth day, John tells us that it was at the sixth hour that he stood before Pilate. And right after telling us that it was at the sixth hour, Pilate then asks, Shall I crucify your king? And the Jewish religious authorities, the second beast, said, We have no king but Caesar. Okay? And so what's happening? The chief priests, the second beast, on the sixth day, at the sixth hour, commit apostasy and essentially write the name of the beast right on their forehead. We have no king but Caesar. Right? We, we were, we're, we're loyal to Caesar. That's, that's our true Lord. Right? And so you put all that together, and the number six itself has all of these symbolic connections with acts of tyrannical men or apostate men opposing God in general. But then, not only that in general, but then secondly, amazingly, if you actually do what then John says to do, right? So then when you actually calculate this number, we see something quite incredible. And uh, so, for one, it should just be noted that in the Hebrew uh, system, they don't have numerals. So, in our English system, we've got English letters, and then we've got numerals. So, if I wanted to write one, I, would, I could write O-N-E, and that could communicate one, or I could just write the number one. Both of them communicate the same thing. Well, in the Hebrew system, they didn't have those numerals. And so, to communicate numerals, each of their letters was designated a specific number. And so you could take any given word, and then you could calculate a number from that. Okay? And therefore, because of this, when you actually take then the number, 666, and you work backwards to figure out what word that actually spells, we get the name, if you can believe it or not, Neron Kaiser, which is the Hebrew form of Nero Caesar. <laughs> the exact emperor who was ruling at that very time. And so is this a mere coincidence? I would say absolutely not. There's no way that this is a mere coincidence that John says, okay, I'm going to give you the number of a specific man. I can't say his name out loud, but I'm going to give you the number of a man, and here's his number. You calculate this, and he'll tell you. And then it happens to spell the very emperor who was ruling at that time. Right? John is telling them who the beast is. He's telling them it's Nero. And therefore, it is the Roman Empire. This is who I'm talking about. This is who you're going to have to be loyal to or else. Right? So that's what he's saying. And uh, that's where the actual text for us this morning comes to a close. So we're going to go on to see uh, later in chapter 14 some of the various things that uh, happens for those who take the mark or not. But all that to say, bringing this to then a close, just by way of summary and then applying, in this passage, we see that John sees another beast arise from the land with two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon and it was associated with the false prophet that we'll later see in Revelation meaning it has religious functions this is all verse 11 and so we argue that this second beast therefore represents the apostate leaders or religious leaders of Jerusalem 
then secondly, the second beast, apostate religious leaders, perform wonders and signs and serves to worship the first beast, Rome, and demands that all people join their synagogues. Their synagogues of Satan now, really, in verses 12 through 15. We saw then how this represents the, that apostate religious leaders uh, sold themselves to Rome. Remember, we have no king but Caesar. And they were enforcing Christians to convert their, to their apostate Judaism. After this, it says that in this unholy union, all people will be required to receive this mark of the beast on their hand or forehead in order to buy or sell. That's verse 16 and 17. And we argue that this does not uh, represent a literal mark, but rather everyone's going to have to be loyal to Rome or else. And then lastly, John gave the specific number of this beast. Uh, the number was 666, and he says, calculate it, it'll tell you who I'm talking about. You do the calculation, and it spells Nero Kaiser, which is, let's say, Nero Caesar. So John tells us who he's talking about. You have to be loyal to Caesar or else. And that's, again, where the text comes to a close. And so, putting all of that together, we can drift into our uh, application at this time, just for the last remaining moments. And the application that I would like to simply extend to us uh, continues to revolve around this very idea or concept of the mark of the beast. Because I want to just again emphasize that the mark, and I've already emphasized it many times, but the mark is not a literal mark uh, that you're going to have to receive on your hand or forehead. I simply say that again because there are many people who have this anxiety or dread kind of foreboding over them, like, I'm afraid, like, I hope I don't accidentally take the mark of the beast as if it were something that you could accidentally get or do somehow. That's not what this is talking about. The mark of the beast uh, uses the very language of hand or forehead in connection with what the Lord had done. So again, in this text, we've seen many unholy parodies of how Satan is trying to basically counterfeit what God has already told them to do. So God told them explicitly in Deuteronomy 6, have your law on, my, on your hand or forehead. And now the beast says, no, 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 you have my law on your hand or forehead. And so the Lord is saying, you be completely loyal to the Lord God, and the beast, Rome, is saying, no, 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 you be completely loyal to me, okay? So that's what we see, that's what the marks are. And therefore, in light of that, the application question that I want to just lob onto every single one of us is then, therefore, which one will we choose? Will we take the mark of the Lord, as it were, having been governed by his law, or will we be governed by the state? Will we be governed by some lesser person or entity? And obviously we know that the, every single one of us knows what the right answer is. It's not a hard question. Uh, on paper, we could all get a good grade on this one. Um, but I pose it to us nevertheless because of the fact that in the moment, like, again, it, removed from an actual situation where you're happy to choose, it's easy to answer. But I, I just want to press it nevertheless so that, Lord willing, it doesn't actually come to this. But if it did ever come to this, where you have to make some sort of decision, then you do have it firmly fixed in your mind which one you will choose, right? Because again, in the first century, Rome was clamping down in persecution. This was going on at this very time. Rome, uh, Nero had set up a, a large image of himself and had demanded absolute obedience unto him throughout the entire empire. This was especially uh, prevalent in Asia Minor, which is where the seven churches are that John is writing to. So many of them are personally dealing with this very idea. We saw when we were looking at the seven churches that many of them had guilds, like in the cities, where if you want to participate in the guilds and thus be able to actually have commerce and do business, then you have to worship the emperor. You have to participate in the pagan festivals. You simply have to do this. And it's, what's interesting is oftentimes they didn't even care if you didn't like, they would, they would say, like, you don't have to mean it. You, you don't have to care about it. You don't have to do it from your heart. Just do it. Just offer the sacrifice. Just offer it and then you can go free. Then you can just continue to conduct in business with us. It's very simple. And the Christians wouldn't do it, right? When it came time to say Caesar is Lord, they would go up and they would say Christ is Lord. And then they would get punished, right? Then they would have to suffer the consequences, right? But they, they did it. They did it. They, they could have probably come up with all sorts of plausible, even pious sounding excuses. Well, we won't mean it. We, we don't believe it. But we're going to do it just so we can get by, so we can continue to provide and, and all the rest. All of that's important, but they didn't compromise in those moments that actually matter. And therefore, obviously, we do not live in the Roman Empire today, but we do nevertheless live in a society, unfortunately, as we speak right now, that is becoming ever increasingly tyrannical, 
and it is uh, becoming ever increasingly apostate, such that we were founded upon blessedly Christian principles and the law of God. And thus, as a nation, we have, inc we have received incredible blessings from this. It's, it's, it's been absolutely amazing. But now, as a nation, we are increasingly turning away from God, forsaking the living God, and now we see increasing anarchy as a result. Right? It's very unfortunate, uh, but all that to say, therefore, because of this trajectory, I'm praying that God will turn it around, that it doesn't come to this. But if it did, where you had to face the ultimatum, where it comes to the point where, okay, you've got to offer your incense to Caesar, right, in the modern-day equivalent, okay? You've got to embrace that homosexuality is beautiful, and you've got to say that transgenderism is acceptable, and you have to say that abortion is a plausible uh, thing that you can do, that it's acceptable for everybody, and you have to, and you have to, and just all these modern equivalents, you've got to do this, or else you will be fired, or else you will lose your livelihood, or else you will be fined, or else you will go to prison, or else, you know, in the most extreme cases, you will be killed, right? If it came to this, I am therefore exhorting us in right now, before it gets to that point, that like the early Christians, that we can go to that moment, we can smile, we can trust in the living God, and we can say, Christ is Lord, not Caesar, and I will have his law govern my life. Thank you very much. And then we have to just brace ourselves for what comes next, because it, it might actually get quite severe, what comes right after that. It, it, it might get very bad, right? But, here's the last word, we can do that with confidence and hope, nevertheless, no matter how bad it gets in the moment, because, as we will actually, again, just a little sneak peek of what we're going to see next week in chapter 14, it actually uh, tells us in uh, verse 1 how it will make reference to the Father's name being written on his people's foreheads. So if we do not apostatize, if we do not compromise, and we remain such that the law of God is marked on us, then it says we will be blessed in Christ. No matter what happens to us in the short run, we will receive the inheritance of the kingdom, which is absolutely glory. It cannot be taken away. Praise be to God. But it goes on to say, if you do take the mark of the beast, though, if you do compromise, if you do give in, if you do just kind of appease them, just so you can kind of get by right now and make no fuss, well, then it says that you will be made to drink from God, the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and will be tormented with fire and sulfur. That's Revelation 14, 10. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to just have some more temporary peace now to then experience everlasting condemnation later. Okay? And so I'm simply exhorting us, let us, let us be prepared, let us make the wise decision. And going back to verse 10 of chapter 13, here is therefore a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Let's pray. Father God, we do praise and thank you for the immense blessings that you have lavished upon us and that you do lavish continuously upon us even as we speak. And we ask, God, that you would, uh, uh, Lord, produce a blessed and profound revival and reformation in this nation such that the things that we were just discussing would never happen, that it wouldn't ever come to the point where we have to make these kind of decisions. But Lord, uh, we do pray that in, uh, no matter what the circumstances might look like specifically for us in the nitty gritty details, we ask that you would uh, give us such a blessed resolve and faithfulness unto you that we would never ever forsake you, that we would never compromise, that we would always uh, remain such that we are loyal unto you in love and that we are governed by your law and not anything else. Lord, we pray that you would bless us with this because we know that the very ability to do this is a gift of your grace and we will not be able to conjure it up of our own, of our own um, effort, of our own choosing. Lord, this has to be granted to us. And so, Lord, we ask for it to apply to every single one of us so that your kingdom would continue to mightily advance in this place and that your glory would continue to mightily abound. We pray all of this with great confidence because we're coming right now in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Before we go to the charge, allow me to just pray for our upcoming potluck, and then we'll do the charge. Father God, we do praise you and thank you once again for giving us this great privilege to continue to fellowship with one another as redeemed saints uh, by your grace through faith, and we thank you for the accomplished work at the cross and in the resurrection. Lord, now we also thank you for this uh, bountiful uh, uh, lunch that we're about to have. We thank you for the provision of it. We ask that in eating it and in the fellowship, you would be mightily glorified. For we ask it in the good name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Now the charge for this morning is this, that Christ was beaten, mocked, and scorned, 
that at the cross, the sin of man and wrath of God was on Jesus laid. He died, he was buried in the grave, but on the third day he rose again from the grave, triumphant over death, the devil, and sin once and for all. And therefore, having been redeemed by the blood of Christ, let us be marked by love for God and for his law, having it on our hands and on our foreheads, no matter what beastly enemy threatens us with for doing so. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Amen.